Now that we know something about the different about how to define continuity in terms of limits, we'll take a look at the different ways in which a function can be discontinuous and how we can recognize that from its limit behavior. We'll begin with a quick review of continuity and limits and the limit definition of continuity, since we'll be relying on that quite a bit in this lesson. And then we'll look at three different types of discontinuity at a point, vertical asymptotes, which we already know something about, and then two others called jump discontinuities and point discontinuities. Let's start by recalling how to define continuity in terms of limits. Here's our definition of continuity at a point. We say that a function f is continuous where x equals c if the limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to f of c. And if this equation is not true for one reason or another, then we say that the function is discontinuous where x equals c. There are a few different ways or possibilities for discontinuity. We're going to look at three of them. And these correspond to three different ways in which our defining equation for continuity can be false. One possibility is that the limit doesn't exist and therefore it can't be equal to f of c because the limit is either positive or negative infinity. And that will give us a vertical asymptote, something we already know about. If you have a limit that's equal to positive or negative infinity, you get a vertical asymptote. The second possibility is that the limit doesn't exist because the one-sided limits as x approach, approaches c disagree with each other. This gives us what's called a jump discontinuity, and we'll look at some examples of that. The third possibility is that the limit exists but doesn't equal the function value. In that case, we get what's called a point discontinuity in our function. So let's take a look at each of these in turn, starting with vertical asymptotes. We already know something about vertical asymptotes. We looked at those in an earlier lesson. The only real thing we need to add here is that when a function has a vertical asymptote, when the line x equals c is its vertical asymptote or one of them, then the function is discontinuous there. And the reason why this happens, if we go to our definition, is that when you have a vertical asymptote at x equals c, the limit as x approaches c doesn't exist, that is, it doesn't have a numerical value, it's either positive or negative infinity. It's also the case then that f of c is undefined. So that equation that defines continuity for us can't be true. Since neither part of that equation is defined, it can't be true. And so our function is discontinuous where x equals c. Let's take a quick look at an example. It's the same example we used when we first introduced vertical asymptotes. So there's the graph of the function defined by one over x squared. Notice that f of zero is undefined. Try to plug it into the function, you'll get an undefined expression. We can also see from the graph that the limit as x approaches zero of f of x does not exist. We can say it's infinity, but that's just a shorthand here. We don't have a number that we can assign to this limit. And therefore, we can say that 1 over x squared is discontinuous at x equals 0. One thing you can also note here, although we don't want to rely too much on this at this point, but if you were to draw the graph of this function by hand, you would need to pick your pencil up at x equals 0. That's another clue that we have a discontinuity at that value of x. Let's turn to a less familiar type of discontinuity, a jump discontinuity. Here's how we can define a jump discontinuity. We have one of these at x equals c when the limit as x approaches c from the left of our function does not equal the limit as x approaches c from the right. Now, in terms of our limit definition of continuity, when these two one-sided limits disagree with each other, the ordinary limit doesn't exist, and so it can't be equal to f of c. Therefore, our function is discontinuous at x equals c. The reason these are called jump discontinuities is because they typically appear in a graph as sort of sudden vertical jumps in the graph. And you typically see these in piecewise defined functions. And they usually show up when they do at places where the function behavior switches, where the definition of the function switches to a different piece 
of the definition. Here's an example. Let's take a look at the function represented by this graph here. This is one we used when we introduced continuity earlier. This function has a jump discontinuity at x equals one. Notice that the limit as x approaches one from the left of this function is zero, but the limit as x approaches one from the right is one. So those two limits disagree with each other. And you can see that in the graph because as we're moving along the graph, let's say we're working from left to right, as we get closer to where x equals zero, sorry, to where x equals one, we're gonna find our y coordinate getting closer and closer to where x equals zero. But then all of a sudden, once we get to where x equals one, we jump up. There's that jump in jump discontinuity. We jump up suddenly and we find ourselves at the point one, one. That's the typical behavior we see in a graph when we have a jump discontinuity. Sometimes, there's a way to sort of make a piecewise function continuous. This is a very common sort of problem, say on the AP calculus exam. What this requires us to do is to find a certain constant to prevent a jump discontinuity from happening. So here's an example. We're gonna find the value of A, where A is a constant here, we just don't know which one, but we want the value of A that makes the function defined here continuous at x equals negative one. Notice negative one is the value of x where our function behavior switches. And so that's a candidate place for a jump discontinuity. We want to choose a value of a to make sure that that doesn't happen. The first thing to note here is that the value of f of negative one is four. We can find that by using our function definition and using the second piece of it. So in order to make sure that our function is continuous at x equals negative one, we need to ensure that the limit as x approaches negative one of f of x is also equal to four. Then our function will satisfy that limit definition of continuity at x equals one or negative one. And for that limit to be equal to four, the limit as x approaches negative one from the left must be equal to four. So we want this equation to be true. The limit as x approaches negative one from the left of f of x ought to be equal to four. Since when x is let to the left of negative one, it's always less than negative one, f of x for values of x less than negative one is always equal to two x plus a. So let's look at this limit. The limit as x approaches negative one of two x plus a. That would be the same as the limit as x approaches negative one from the left of f of x. That limit on the left, we can find by substitution. I'm gonna plug negative one in for x. That gives us an equation whose only unknown is a, and we can solve it for a. Do a little bit of algebra, and you'll get that a must be equal to six. What we can conclude from this is that our function will be continuous at x equals negative one as long as a is equal to six. If a has any other value, we will have a jump discontinuity where x equals negative one. The third kind of discontinuity we'll take a look at here is called a point discontinuity. Let's see how to identify these. The analytical clue that we have a point discontinuity is that the limit of our function as x approaches c exists, but does not equal f of c. And that can happen either because f of c is undefined or because it's defined but happens to be different from the limit. These show up in graphs as what are sometimes called holes. They're little individual points that the graph basically skips over. And these are usually indicated in a graph with an open circle. We've seen some of these already. Let's look at an example. What we'll look at here is the graph of this function here, defined by x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. There's the graph. Looks basically like a straight line, but you can see there's a little hole there marked by, by that open circle. Now, let's look at the limit as x approaches 1 of this function. 
that's equal to two. You can figure that out from the graph or you could figure it out using our simplification method for finding limits and applying it to our function. F of one, however, is undefined. Try to plug one in for X in that function definition, you'll get an undefined expression. So in this case, the limit does not equal the function value because the function value doesn't exist. So we have a point discontinuity at X equals one. Sometimes point discontinuities are also called removable discontinuities. Let's see why. The reason is because when a function has a point discontinuity, say at x equals c, we can find another function that basically removes the discontinuity. The function, the new function, call it g, behaves just like f as long as x is not equal to c, but is continuous at x equals c. And then we say that g removes the discontinuity. Another name you'll sometimes see for this, it's a little fancier sounding, we call g the continuous extension of f. So let's look at an example. Let's go back to our example from earlier. We saw that our function here, x squared minus one over x minus one, has a removable discontinuity at x equals one. There's the graph again. That circle, the open circle marking the hole, is at the point one, two. The way to remove this discontinuity is to define another function, we'll call it g. It'll behave just like f when x is not equal to one, but it will actually go through the point one, two instead of skipping over it. So what we want here is a function g that behaves just like f when x is not equal to one. So we'll set this up piecewise. But to make sure that our graph goes through the point one, two, we'll say that g of x is equal to two when x is equal to one. That function there removes the discontinuity in f. A somewhat simpler expression for the same function is x plus one. And x plus one is the function whose graph is just the straight line that we see in the graph above, but without that hole in it. So these would be two different ways of representing the same function, the one that removes the discontinuity in F. So those are two different analytical representations of the same function. 